Good evening to everybody who is in here already this this evening, this morning, wherever you are in the world. And welcome to week three of our webinars about the Internet of Things. Uh, this is, uh, in case you're wondering if you're in the right place, this is IT Masters and Charles Sturt University presenting a free short course on the Internet of Things. Uh, this is week three, which we've decided to call Machines and Humans this week. Um, it's about devices and communications and the like. As always, in the first couple of minutes, I'll leave you here to chat amongst yourself in the chat. Let us know where you're from. If you've got anything particular to say, to say hello. And I'm going to give it about five minutes until everybody gets in through the front door. So I will um, turn off now and we'll be speaking to you again in about three to four minutes. Uh, welcome. back into the third of our Internet of Things webinars. And I see that my computer is deciding to play silly buggers and is flashing up different things on the screen. But this is the third of our four week free short course on the Internet of Things, uh, subtitled Machines and Humans this week, presented by Charles Sturt University or presented by IT Masters on behalf, if you like, of Charles Sturt University. My name is Shane Murphy, and let's just quickly go through the usual housekeeping tonight. So um, feel free to chat amongst yourselves in the chat. There's all sorts of stuff you can talk about in there. And remember, as uh, Lil has just said, to set your chat to everyone if you actually want your fellow attendees to see what's happening. If you have actual questions for us to answer as part of the presentation, uh, please put those into the Q&A thing that comes up on the bottom or the top of your screen. Uh, there's a little Q&A next to the chat there and click on that and, answer, and put your question in there and we will go through. We'll answer as many of them as we can during the session. Uh, we will probably pause once or twice to answer questions as we're going, as well as um, at the end of the session. I see that tonight we have people from all over the world, Canada, the Netherlands, Zimbabwe, Zambia, uh, Brazil, just about every corner of the world. Uh, not many from Asia, as far as I can see, but maybe I'm just not looking. Uh, somebody from Riyadh, for example. So welcome to everybody from all around the world. And of course, plenty of people from here in Australia. We're webcasting as it is from Melbourne, sunny Melbourne today, which is lovely for a change. Our amazing moderator, Lil, will be handling the questions and making sure, and we'll be giving you um, all sorts of other bits of information. You'll see it popped in with the little IT masters next to it. Um, uh, all the sort of notes and things, because everybody does always ask us, well, will the uh, courses be available afterwards? Yes, they will. Once you've registered for the course at learn.itmasters.edu.au, if you log in there, all the materials are there. Now, tonight is week three, and Jeff Jenkins will be leading it. But before we do that, I'd like to acknowledge that we are webcasting tonight from Warren country. 
the lands of the Wurundjeri people, and I wish to acknowledge them as the traditional owners of this land. I'd also like to pay my respects to their elders past and present and to Aboriginal elders of other communities who may be attending virtually today as well. Um, now, as you know, or I've probably figured out from the last couple of weeks, Jeffrey is an engineer and a technical person, and he's got lots to talk about. Uh, this week, you'll see these changed his photo just to remind us all of his uh, past life as an archaeologist or past and present and future life as an archaeologist and a uh, interpreter of ancient text, um, which is a fantastic thing to be able to go and visit those places. And I'm going to hand most of it over to him tonight. He'll be driving everything and I will be pushing buttons and uh, chiming in from time to time. So welcome, Jeffrey. How are you this evening? Uh, thank you very much, Shane. I'm I'm fine. I join uh, in your acknowledgement um, uh, of uh, country and uh, traditional owners. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I'm I'm um, doing okay. We had a lovely day in Melbourne today, uh, and um, uh, unseasonably warm. Um, but I think tomorrow's not going to be like that. So uh, enjoy it while it lasts. As always, four seasons in a week, if if not in a day. Uh, good. So um, I will launch in. Um, I, we've called this Machines and Humans. I'm not sure that that was a, a, a sensible title, but uh, it does uh, provoke a conversation about something that's quite important and got raised last week uh, in an interesting way because we talked for a, a, a little um, time on the chat last week about uh, banking systems, and particularly banking systems in Africa. Uh, and uh, somebody pointed out that that they weren't really IoT systems because uh, people at either end were entering the data uh, on their phones. Uh, and I, I, I thought about that for a bit, and uh, I'm inclined to argue that, in fact, um, there are always people involved in um, IoT systems somewhere along the line, in the design or uh, in the consumption of the data or in the checking of the data. Um, it's really difficult to imagine an IoT system, even an old one like SCADA, that uh, didn't, wouldn't have involved uh, people in some shape or form. But the people are normally at the receiving end. So I drew this diagram, hand drew it actually, I don't know whether you can tell, um, the the evolution of the system, uh, I called it, and it has it's a sort of harbour bridge. It has three levels. Um, it begins. I labelled the two ends: producer and consumer. Those of you who um, write uh, software will be familiar with that terminology. Uh, and uh, at the base level, it has. Uh, uh, we could call that M to M traffic going from left to right, indicated by the arrows. Nothing much going back the other way. Uh, I put the the guy at the producer end in a box because he really doesn't play much of a role until we get to higher levels. Uh, but the guy at the the right, guy or girl, looks like a guy actually. Um, uh, is um, is certainly playing a role looking at the resulting data that's been transmitted. Uh, and uh, so that's where we were, but the focus for this week really is on uh, what's going on now. Um, so uh, M2M stands for machine to machine. Um, uh, and... Uh, and IoT, of course, the Internet of Things. And if you go up a level, then you need to, uh, then you will engage with the Internet. And so I've drawn it in there. Um, now, uh, we have to admit something, don't we, Shane, right at the beginning. And that is that when we think of the Internet of Things, then Shane and I are very inclined to think about SIM cards. Um, and that's because we um, work together uh, selling SIM cards. Uh, and it's worthwhile pointing out, I think, Shane, and admitting that when you look at this diagram, I've actually drawn the SIM card in on the left-hand side, that tiny little square in the corner. 
Uh, and that, uh, Shane's pointing it out to us, thank you. And that was um, the focus of our interest, wasn't it, Shane? And um, so in, effectively, the SIM was a proxy for connectivity. So Internet of Things, data is being sent, messaging is being sent uh, from uh, one point to another um, over the internet. Uh, and the way you get internet, of course, is that you um, go um, to Shane and get a SIM card. Now, of course, there are other ways to get uh, internet. It doesn't have to be mobile. Um, it can it it, it can be uh, landline. Uh, and uh, but we thought about it as uh, as um, very much uh, uh, mobile data. Now, um, the thing we have to admit that that uh, is as well for us to mention in this context, because uh, it has a lot to do with whether if you have an IoT project, you're ever going to make any money out of it, uh, is that connectivity is a fraction of an Internet of Things system. Uh, and I tried to indicate that by the diagram. Um, uh, there's a, a big box on the left. Uh, with someone sitting in it there's a big box on the right and there's a tiny little sim card there and the way we we used to think about that not as often as we should have is that uh, uh you you need to be interested in much more of the system than just the connectivity so there's hardware on the left there's hardware on the right and now these days there's virtual hardware in the middle uh and so um, and what's tended to happen is that people buy the hardware on the right or the hardware on the left, and with it comes connectivity. Uh, and so if you're only selling connectivity, then you may not uh, get an audience at all. Uh, and where that comes really to bear on our conversation is if you go right to the top there, the top arch of the bridge, um, I put AWS in there. Um, so this is, um, as it were, a, um, a, a a bridge piece between the uh, producer and the consumer. Uh, notice now we're starting to get traffic in two directions, both from producer to consumer and from uh, cons uh, consumer to producer. Actually, that's not exactly right. Uh, to say it that way, uh, but that's a detail we'll get into a little bit later. So, so that's um, that that uh, a way of thinking about this, and the way in which that's becoming more complex, uh, I think, is not a bad place for us to start in terms of the way Internet of Things works these days. And we'll look at some examples as we go along. Um, so, I'm focusing on everything except the. The, uh, the the chat, Shane. So I'm I'm assuming you're you're looking at the chat, and um, yep. uh, if someone's saying why doesn't he move on, then let's move on. So same diagram, but I gave you a little reminder of it there. Um, so I I want to talk a little bit about Internet of Things as a system, uh, and I want to. Uh, pick out a couple of details that we've talked about in previous weeks, uh, but which will um, come up for discussion in our examples as we go along tonight. Uh, and uh, and so um, uh, I've listed them, probably only some of them, in fact. So an overview of the um, evolution of the system. And I've emphasised system here because system's what we want to think about all of the bits comprise an Internet of Things system. Uh, and not only will it not work if you've only got one bit of it, but you may not make money if you're only interested in one bit of it either. Uh, so uh, that's that's why we need to think about it systemically as much to make some money from it um, as to ensure that it will actually work when we implement it. So they're core components and uh, I think um, probably these days the core component include the core components include um, the AWS or Azure 
as we'll see later in an example, uh, or whatever our cloud is. Um, now, uh, what's particularly interesting is that if you want these days to implement an IoT system, then you really only need to go to AWS, uh, look at their marketplace, uh, and they will sell you devices for particular applications, sensors for particular applications. If they need a SIM card, they'll have a SIM card in it. Um, uh, that SIM card will work wherever you're, you uh, intend to send your device in the world. Uh, and so um, really, AWS uh, uh, is... Um, uh, uh, I'm, I, I shouldn't read the notes, should I? I'll, I'll, I'll let that argument go through to the keeper for the minute. Um, to make the point that um, uh, AWS is, is, has now become an Internet of Things marketplace. Uh, and so not only does the traffic go through there in both directions, both from the uh, consumer, uh, the producer to the consumer and back again, but um, all of the acquisition goes through there too, if you let it. Um, so we've seen this in the last little while. We'll talk a bit more about Iridium uh, as one of the communications channels a bit later tonight um, uh, with an example. Uh, and we, what, we've, um, what we've seen in the last little while is that uh, Iridium did um, a deal with AWS. Now Iridium deliver their messaging direct into AWS uh, if you want to receive that messaging, then you put a, a virtual machine inside of your own, inside AWS, uh, and you provide Iridium with some details about the links, uh, and your messaging arrives uh, fully secure. And any involvement that, that others may have had in delivering that messaging, that's sort of gone away. So um, there's something very important there, I think, that we need to uh, observe. Now my stress on uh, logic. So uh, when we think about the, uh, the Internet of Things and a structure like this, then we need to recognize that there, there's programming logic in uh, all of the uh, elements, or potentially so at least. Um, so uh, these days, mostly what um, the producer may be uh, is fully programmable. Certainly anything that's happening in AWS, fully programmable by the person who implements the system. Uh, and certainly there's plenty of programming to be done uh, on the recipient end um, as the messages arrive and as response messages are sent back. Um, so uh, there's these are what you might call logic contexts. And and Next week, we will even talk about the SIM card as a logic context because modern SIM cards have some programming on them. Most of us don't do that programming. It's specialist work, although it's quite fun to do. Um, so you might like to, um, uh, to consider uh, getting involved in writing applets for uh, SIM cards. Um, but my point is simply that everywhere in this system, uh, at every at every transverse point, there is some uh, programming going on, uh, and what we need to do, I think, is to think about our IoT systems as opportunities for us to uh, program, to design the system, to implement it in such a way that uh, it does what we want it to do, uh, and our skills earn us some benefit from our involvement. So. Uh, as part of that logic, I mentioned interoperability. So the idea here is not only uh, do we have some logic in AWS and we have some logic in the producer and in the uh, consumer, um, but uh, those logic contexts interoperate. Um, so one will be um, one will be managing the performance of another in this system. Uh, they will talk to each other, uh, they will converse, uh, and uh, and you, uh, the end result will be something that um, that uh, benefits from the way in which they interoperate. 
So I repeat myself here, I think. Programmability is key to the evolving Internet of Things system. Uh, to be able to, in all these devices, big systems, servers, um, small systems, modules, SIM cards even, uh, all of them are programmable. So the other thing we mentioned last week, which is very important, isn't it, um, is this range and ubiquity idea. So back in the day, uh, two machines might have been at opposite ends of the factory and they would talk to each other. Uh, but over, over uh, a network, a link of some sort, um, uh, using a customised protocol, uh, these days, uh, because uh, wherever you can have the internet, you can have the internet of things, uh, we, we can um, extend that range uh, around the corner or across the world. Uh, and uh, because uh, these me this messaging is not just uh, on cellular networks, but it's also on satellite networks, uh, we, uh, we have ubiquity. That is to say, we can set up these systems absolutely anywhere. But if I told In the theory. story, Shane, I, um, about... Um, about the uh, uh, um, the ability of Iridium uh, to support uh, an ATM machine uh, on the South Pole. Um, uh, and it would work perfectly well there. Um, since it wouldn't get much use, the fact that it didn't have high bandwidth wouldn't matter. Uh, and strangely enough, even if your ATM machine on the South Pole fell down a crevice, it would still work uh, using uh, Iridium messaging, uh, which is rather uh, remarkable. It won't make a very good IoT project, so um, uh, forget I mentioned it. I, I would say with security, you talk about SIM card. The, the prime purpose initially of the SIM card is for security. Uh, yes, yes, uh, uh, indeed. And um, these networks are, um, are not necessarily uh, as open as my diagram uh, Im implies. Uh, and the SIM card has all sorts of um, capabilities to, to um, work over private networks uh, in such a way that the messaging is well protected. And so, by the way, does Iridium, although the weird thing is, up until very recently, in fact, up until pretty much when Iridium was delivered inside AWS in the last couple of years, um, almost all of that messaging went over the public internet. Uh, and it was, um, it's, it's quite open uh, and because of the Iridium protocol. It's very easy to work out exactly what's in the message. Uh, so if you could see one go past, that then you could interpret it without a lot of trouble. Um, that uh, is is um, a bit weird when you think about it because the Iridium system is completely private all the way uh, to, to the delivery of the message to the customer and then it becomes completely public. Uh, so uh, it's as well that we've moved beyond that now. Uh, did you want to say something more about... Um, uh, Sims and privacy, Shane, or we we focus on it next week a bit as well. I think we'll talk about it later on. I um, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit conscious of time, but essentially the SIM cards were designed for identity and security, and that was their primary purpose. And yes, the yeah, fact yeah. that we can, in theory, put applets on them to, and some people have done that in quite a big way, um, to make I uh, make them essentially the IoT collection device and processing device to a certain extent. And as you talked before about locations for logic, there's logic at every stage in the process, no matter how um, stupid we might say that the end device is. Um, but uh, it is it is a it's an unusual example, and uh, and Iridium itself has SIM cards in as an as a operation because iridium initially was just gsm in the sky and gprs in the sky it has evolved since then of course yeah yeah let's move on yes please so the good thing for us is uh, this is all opportunity for us not necessarily because we're uh, programmers 
we might be programmers, but our but the point of it is that uh, if we're involved in IoT pro, um, projects, then somebody's going to be programming. Um, and if we're leading and designing, then uh, we may not do the programming, but we have to recognize that it needs to be done. So my three examples are uh, one with limited comms, one with what I call simple comms, uh, and one with complex comms. Uh, the, the limited comms one is Telstra Track and Monitor, uh, and I gave you a picture there of the uh, device. You'll see Telstra written on it. It's a Cat M1 device. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what it does and how it might be used, and particularly how it might be enhanced uh, in our first uh, example shortly. Um, uh, the second uh, example involves uh, the the um, uh, railway carriage, you'll see. Um, my scale's a bit poor, isn't it? That, that Telstra device is about uh, 10 centimetres long. That railway carriage is longer than that. Um, uh, and uh, I've given you a rally car uh, for the third example, which involves both cellular and satellite, and is an example of complex comms. And we can jump now, Shane, already to the Telstra track and monitor. So it, it is always interesting that we have to provide a picture of what is essentially a black box. Indeed. Except in this case, it's a beige box, which is even funnier. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, actually, it's a very nice box. You see, if you look closely, you'll see um, the the uh, there's a little um, almost stud. It's an IP67 casing, um, and there's a a little um, antenna, as it seems, just uh, at, on the lower side. Shane can point that out, I think. Um, uh, and it's it's rather nice. That has multiple functions. Um, don't give my game away, Shane. Um, uh, and um, uh, including actually enabling it. Um, this is a, a nice device in the sense that um, being IP67, it has no, that is to say, it's got a very secure casing, weatherproof and the like. Um, uh, and it's, so it has no external antenna and it has no, its antenna is internal uh, and it has no, uh, power supply connections either uh, uh, because it has an internal battery which la lasts the life of the device maybe as much as five years maybe a bit uh, less if you ask it to talk more frequently those things speak to the sort of stuff we were talking about last year in that the development of battery technology has enabled these sorts of devices to be, become viable and secondly, that ubiquity of the networks has also enabled internal antennas to become a reasonable proposition rather than when we first started out. And in most operations, you would have external antennas mounted on the top of the roof of a car in order to provide the reflex, uh, the connectivity and the um, uh, the reflection for the um, for the signal to get into the device, which of course made them always points for failure in any system. And by having it as a single enclosed device now, you've got a much more enclosed and robust platform from which to operate. And that's why manufacturers are tending to move towards that that way. So I called this um, uh, limited comms. Um, uh, in some ways, it's not limited. It's a rather splendid device uh, in that uh, it, it talks uh, CAT M1. Uh, uh, about which we'll we'll do quite a bit of detail, uh, I expect, uh, next uh, week, including discussing uh, power management and the like. But for the moment, um, uh, that uh, that has the benefit that uh, its 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 range is uh, better than ordinary LTE, um, and so it um, uh, it. Uh, it will work in a lot of places where uh, ordinary tracking devices won't work. By the way, I should have mentioned that all three of my examples are moving ones um, uh, tonight, and so we better do one that's stationary next week, Shane, so that we can make our point about 
um, about uh, devices going dead on the network. You see that that all of all of what's happening in this simple diagram is internal to Telstra, except a little bit on the end. Uh, uh, so there's somebody sitting at a terminal uh, interrogating uh, the details of what the device is sending to Telstra. So good, this good device... question from Tim there, by the way, he's asking what this device actually does. It tracks. Yes, it... it tracks. Yes, it tracks. It's pretty simple. It sends temperature data, and it sends, uh, and it sends uh, location. It's also uh, ev evidence of the way that the, as you said, systems are becoming important. So that uh, a lot of the bigger players now, and Telstra in Australia, for those of you overseas, is our used to be our national carrier and is now the largest market share carrier still in the country. Um, so it's a good one to use for an example because they have a lot of stuff. But what they're actually doing is trying to maintain control over m as much of the whole system as they can, primarily to maximise their income, but also so that they get a good quality of service from end to end throughout the whole process. Whereas in the past, and still often to these days, people would make devices of their own and then attempt to put them on a network and then they would find that there was something particular about network A or network B that meant that their device didn't work quite the way it was envisaged to because every network, despite GSM, uh, sorry, GSM, 5G, 4G, 3G, all being standardised networks, every implementation of every network has its own little quirks and decisions that are made by the people building the network that determine the way it operates in the real world. And they are all different. Nothing operates exactly according to spec. And so that that is why, apart from financial reasons, that the carriers in particular have become heavily involved in providing solutions end-to-end to end users. Yeah, so um, this device has a Telstra SIM card in it. Um, you you can't even find out the, the phone number of that SIM card. Uh, yeah, um, which seemed to me a pity for, for a reason I'll describe in a moment. But uh, all of that's all of that's internal. Uh, a Telstra SIM card on Telstra networks only, uh, and um, actually that's not quite true because these devices work overseas. Interestingly enough, but um, uh, that that's a complication that even Telstra didn't really anticipate. Um, so. Uh, these de these um, devices tra for tracking, for vehicle tracking especially, uh, as in the example that we'll go on to look at now, now I think, Shane. But um, the stress of that, there's a diagram again. Um, I've specially turned uh, Telstra around there so that um, uh, it's written from right to left for any of you who are um, coming from countries where you write in that direction. Um, so uh, there's the, the summary, battery up to five years, IP67 casing, CAT M1 with enhanced coverage uh, and power management, all Telstra private network. Uh, come back to design driven in a second, but it's inexpensive to operate this one. Um, uh, uh, Telstra, uh, the device itself is relatively inexpensive to buy. Uh, and uh, and then it, um, uh, it you don't have to um, uh, replace the battery. Uh, you, the assumption is that you'll throw the thing away when you're finished with it or recycle it appropriately. Um, <clears throat> but um, uh, the, the Telstra SIM card is certainly not an expensive SIM card, the one that's in it. Uh, the data is is limited by the way in which the device behaves, so you can't run up a huge bill. Um, and in fact, the the cost of running it on the network is quite um, quite low. Um, it's design driven in some ways. I think this goes back to what Shane was talking about in previous weeks. Um, it's always seemed to me that this project. Um, uh, 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 is a um, uh, this is a build it and they will come, isn't it, Jeff? Uh, it is, it is. It's 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 somebody saying, if only we had a device, Cat M1, IP67, battery powered, um, on our network, 
lots of people would buy it. Um, and are they? No, strangely enough, no. Um, uh, and I and I, I I don't know. Actually, I don't know because I'm uh, I'm involved in conversations with Telstra about this all the time. Um, but they give me the impression that they desperately want us to sell it, um, uh, and um, I suspect that's because um, they've got a couple of garages full of them somewhere. Yes, I, I would imagine so. In fact, I would, if I was to take a guess, having seen many of these build it and they will comes in the past, I would imagine that the failure of it is related to several things. One was nobody had a plan for who it was actually going to be sold to in the first place. Second, the end result of what it outputs is probably several years behind what people want these days. And it probably does a very good job of showing dots going around on a map, but probably doesn't have some of the other bells and whistles that the more sophisticated systems have these days that actually um, do monitoring, uh, fences, alarms, all that sort of stuff, or that the software that's with it is perhaps not built to purpose or is hard to customize. So if it is the sort of thing that you know, so they have put into the market and said, well, here's a very basic system, come and join it. Uh, what happens is, is that most organizations look at it and say, oh, it'd be really good if only it did this and if only it did that. And then they'll find that the, you know, it's either very expensive to modify it or it just can't do it. Is prop I suspect that they're probably some of the things underlying it. And then on top of that, you've got the second tier problem, which is channel to market. They haven't thought very clearly about who's capable of being able to sell these things because these selling an IoT product into a market is as much about consulting and understanding the business problem as it is everything else. And so um, that is exactly the bit of it that they've left out of their business case, I would think. So... Um... Uh, there's a meeting this week, so I'll um, I'll ask the questions, and I might have a chance to report on the answers next uh, Wednesday night if you join us. I I put in a reference to uh, SMS control there. It gives me a chance to use this word control, uh, which I think is uh, very uh, important. Um, th this is the idea that you you don't you 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 want your your a uh, producer device, your uh, tracking uh, device or uh, your sensor or whatever, uh, you want it to be flexible, adjustable, uh, and sometimes you want it to actually do things in the field. We talked last time about uh, that, that application where uh, the sensor might be an individual sensor for each uh, vine in a vineyard. Uh, and that uh, would supply information about <clears throat> the hydrology uh, of the uh, soil, how much um, how much water there was there. Um, <clears throat> uh, and but it might do more than that. Uh, it might uh, it 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 might actually be able to receive a message saying release so much water, and it may have control over a valve. Um, and so all of those processes. Uh, both the reporting and the response and the action to be taken, all of that is uh, is potentially achieved by being able to send a control message. And a great, uh, anyone who's programmed modems will know um, that if you um, uh, if you uh, are registered on the network, even if your data session is not up because you've got the wrong APN or something else has gone wrong. You can still send an SMS to the device, and the device can receive that SMS um, of several types uh, and can take action based on it. it. Can change the APN, or it can reboot the device, or whatever needs to be done. Uh, and it's such a nifty way to, uh, for example, modify this device so that it reports more or less frequently, or reports only in the mornings, or reports only when it's um, uh, when there's a certain temperature, ambient temperature. All of those controls might be available, but the key thing is you have to think about it in advance because you can't send an SMS to a device and say, 
do this, do that. If you didn't think in advance, what would happen when a certain SMS with a certain format arrived? Um, and that's why this is frequently left out because people don't think of it. Um, so I bolded it. There you are. Thank you, Shane. So, it goes back to you saying that there was no phone number for the device as well. Yes, it does. Yeah, yeah. Can't know the phone number. But of course, as they say to me, who needs to know the phone number because you're not going to send it an SMS. Well, I say to them, if it hasn't got, if it hasn't got a data session that, but it's registered on the network, then I want to be able to send it an SMS. Well, there you are. Now, I, I've added something in here, um, uh, because um, uh, we've got a little project at the university, one of the masters in software engineering projects at Melbourne Uni. Uh, which I happen uh, for my sins to be um, supervising this year. Um, they've just finished uh, the team doing uh, this project. And what they have done is taken this rather simple device uh, and they have built a much more complex and interesting service around it. And the way they did this was... Um, uh, instead of just sitting at a terminal and sending instructions using the API, essentially, uh, in some limited way, they have built um, a an, an API client, uh, which is using um, a whole uh, a whole lot of capability to dredge messaging out of uh, the Telstra database. Now that API client is in fact um, uh, um, HTTPS, uh, HTTPS for them, um, so it's fully secure. And they have built uh, into, a, into AWS uh, a really nice complex uh, um, point of storage for a whole lot of information. So look on this diagram at what that's let them do. So they don't want information just from the Telstra device. They would also like to link that to some weather information. And so what they did was say, every time a message reaches us uh, uh, with a location in it, we will grab for that location the weather for that timestamp. And we will store that together with the original message. All of that they built into what we call the smart layer. So that produces uh, merging. It does a whole lot of um, anonymizing. It's not how you spell it. Um, so there's a, a, a lot of real smarts built into that, which greatly enhanced the Telstra device. To now, what end, I might ask? Uh, yeah, so let's go over, Shane, to the next page, and I'll give you a couple of examples. Great. Um, so um, uh, there you are. I've 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 listed. Um, so, for example, supplementation. That's the idea that you grab some weather, uh, uh, and then you build that into the database uh, of uh, tracking locations augmentation. The smart layer manages all of that. Um, looks at all the messaging coming in, enhances it, stores it in particular ways, and uh, devolves it uh, uh, out to um, customers. And Shane, you mentioned, and we discussed it, analysis and research um, as uh, very important aspects of what IoT is about. Uh, and this is where that's going on. Um, so uh, so that's um, that's uh, of, of uh, value to refer to there. Now, here's my example. So... I don't know those of you who um, who are not from Victoria uh, probably don't know what a hoon is, uh, or at least uh, you won't know what impounding a hoon, a hoon vehicle is. So it's a process where if you drive uh, like a madman, um, then the government will take your car off you for a certain period of time. I think I, it, I think it specifically relates to people who do things like street racing that's dangerous in hotted up cars that are potentially illegal as vehicles in the first place. Yep, yep. Uh, and 
and uh, so your car gets impounded. And the proposal that the uni uh, students made um, is that if your if your car gets impounded, then it gets one of these trackers attached to it. Um, and then what the smart layer does is it watches where you go. And if you happen to be going in the same direction in close proximity to somebody else with a, um, a, a Hoon tracker on board, then it, um, it flags an alarm because it, it's likely to be, might be an accident, might be, might be a car accident actually, but might be a, um, uh, an illegal street race. Um, and sort of, sort of like having um, breathalysers installed for cars that people who register over the alcohol blood limit. A little bit like that. A little bit like that. So the second application was what we call here flight plans. The uni students have called it that. Uh, this is the idea that if you, particularly if you rent a car, but not only if you rent a car, and you are driving a long distance, um, then you. Uh, you plan how far you're going to drive. Um, and the device monitors uh, um, how well you take your rest breaks. Um, so the important thing is, and it's a rule for truck drivers and should be a rule for car drivers too, a couple of hours is long enough and then you really need to take a break. I never did it until I got old. Um, but uh, it's um, it's important to do. And I'm sure when you drive up to Orange, Shane, you um, take your regular breaks, don't you? Mm, I'm I'm notorious for driving straight through. Yeah, well, I I think that there's there's all sorts of well, let's go back to what we were saying before. Again, to a certain extent, because it is a uni project, it is a solution looking for a problem. However, having said that, you could enhance it in five or six different ways to make it potentially more attractive. So, a we don't know that the police want to track hoons in that way but you might want to also say that and i don't know if the device is capable of that you would measure the relative acceleration of the device and have a rule that said you know if they accelerate too hard too often then that's a penalty for example um or in the flight plans if you know they a bit like what we were describing last week if they appear to do certain things that appear to meet the rules but don't actually then um, you know that that will contravene the rules but again, I would go back to the business case with those and say, well, with the flight plan, that's a great idea. How do you make, what is the impetus for making people comply with them or to do them? For example. Yes, yeah. And so I truck drivers it, have to because it's the law. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, I, I think the, um, the student's answer to that is free coffee. Um, uh, and so they, that's part of their the design of their project to work out a way of providing free coffee um, uh, at various towns where you might stop. Work, working um, out where to put it. Yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I mean, I was going to ask you at the end, Shane, but it, it's as well for you to comment on each one as we go through, um, how much chance is that of got of making somebody some money? Um, tracking plat, yes, uh, um, everyone know what that symbol means? Um, Donuts. Uh, yes, but um, uh, tracking platforms are everywhere around uh, and feeding data in from the Telstra tracker uh, might be uh, of benefit. Who knows? I, I'm sure there, there will be individual applications. The question is, does it become a commercially viable product in the, in the medium term or does it suit a particular application in a particular way? So they've designed it now they're looking out for applications where it suits rather than saying well here's a problem we need to solve the problem i'm still fascinated by what part the weather information plays it's great that the weather information is imported but where's the relevance for of the weather information oh uh, the, the the idea is that if you if you had these devices out there and you use them for road safety research um then then uh, you can reconstruct an accident using the data um, but it would be really nice to know what the weather was uh, there at the time. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. Great idea. Uh, yeah. So they're smart, the uni students. So this one is uh, an example of simple comms. Um, it's just uh, uh, SMS. Um, but I wanted to, 
I wanted to use it as a, a case in point to show that um, uh, th th there's an organizing principle uh, around a fairly complex process like this one. Um, there's a there's a um, some sort of central brain that's making all the observations, which means that when certain conditions are met, something happens, uh, then the right uh, the right um, messaging uh, is forwarded. Um, so the po the point of this one is um, that's the that's a Victorian train. Uh, you'll recognise that as um, as Jollymont Railway Station just near the MCG where the big game was played. Um, uh, and uh, I've, I've represented the, the four carriage train by giving um, car numbers to uh, each. And the idea is um, the, the driver has a mobile phone uh, with her uh, and that mobile phone has a bit of detail like what the car numbers are that constitute the train. Uh, and it constantly reports where it is on the network. So in each in each carriage, there's a little sign that says, if you feel uncomfortable, text some number, which is the number of the car, to some number, which is an SMSMO uh, service. Um, and so all of those texts, if and when they come in, uh, are stored in a little database, which has quite a lot of logic associated with it because it has to be able to work out which carriage uh, in which train, in which location that message was sent from. Uh, and so it needs to know a lot about uh, what's going on on the network. Uh, and Shane, if you jump forward a slide, then you'll see uh, the the uh, essential application here. Um, uh, in Victoria, we have um, uh, police, two of them, uh, on every railway station uh, on the suburban network uh, from roughly 6 p.m. until the last train. Uh, and so, uh, but when that was first introduced, somebody said, well, we have a problem, and that is that... Um, there might be a fist fight going on in the in the uh, train, but nobody will know. Um, and the train will stop and it'll head off and uh, and uh, the, the no no one will be able to uh, let the police know. So that's what this pro this process does. It just sends a message uh, to the relevant police because the uh, brain behind the system knows which police are on the next um, station that the train is going to go to. Or indeed uh, on the train itself. Yes. Uh, yeah, indeed. My my um, my uh, diagram lets us down a little bit there because uh, that logic should also be talking to the train driver, but never mind. So um, I like this example because it's, and in fact, we can, we can jump, Shane, to the next one because the one after it's going to take us some time because it's the complex one but i like this one because um it's such a trivial form of communication um it's an it's an sms initiated by uh somebody sitting in a carriage ideally a few people sitting in a carriage because the system detects that it's got multiple reports from the same carriage and it then prioritizes them um uh, and so that that um, SMS, which just contains uh, as little as four characters, and all of the rest of what happens is automated. Um, so it's it's rather uh, it, it's rather nifty, I think, um, because uh, it it will work with even my mum's not very smartphone. Uh, she can send an SMS, and she knows how to do that she, if she's un. Uh, uncomfortable on the train because somebody's drunk or whatever, um, she could easily enough send this message. Um, this is out of date, this one, because we uh, have a, new, a brand new um, a smart phone system for doing the same thing. 
Uh, yeah, the, inter it's... the interesting thing is you could argue that in some ways it's not IoT because it's actually user initiated as you've got there. Um, so it's not a device talking to a device. It's essentially a person raising an alarm. Yes. Yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and, and th that's that's right, Shane. But then um, the moment that happens, then all the rest of it is um, is um, Internet of Things. It's it's yeah. um, it's uh, systems and uh, logic settings chatting with each other. It's interesting, Roy in the chat has just said that it'd be useful for system then flagged and you know recorded the video footage from the carriage because which I'm assuming that's probably what happens with the smartphone app. And in fact, as we're sitting in here, my uh, my security system on a property that I have about 125 k's away from here just goes off randomly because a bird's flown past and has recorded a photo of it. And then I can go in and record the footage if I need to. Yes. Yeah. 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 So you might um, you might uh, have to rush off. You don't have to rush off, Shane. No, I don't have to rush off. As no. I said, it was a bird a bird flying past. But those sorts of things, and it it is interesting to note that those applications, those sorts of things, we did videos of them twenty five years ago, despite the fact that we didn't actually quite have them working, but we knew they were going to come, and sure enough, they have come. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. You, know, you buy them at Bunnings now. Bunnings is the hardware chain here. You buy them at the big hardware chains. Cost you, you know, hundred dollars to set in, and cost you nothing to run except for what you use on your phone for the data, because you've got an app that's provided by the service provider, and so it is all automated the whole process. And that's essentially similar to this. This, but I, I like the fact this is SMS and just tri triggered by one single SMS, rather than people having to stand behind and video it and then send the video to the TV network to get some publicity about racists on trains or whatever it is that there has been happening. Uh, indeed. Actually, if you look really closely in that picture, you'll see somebody actually uh, sending one of these messages. <laughs> uh, so um, I I didn't paste him in either. No. Um, uh, now, we, we might take a very quick break, Shane, should we, before we do the complex one? Um, well, there's only really one question at the moment that's outstanding, which is it's safe to say that the SIM card is not an IoT. In fact, actually, there are two questions. I'll get the second one in a minute. Safe to say that the SIM card is not an IoT device, but plays a crucial role in the IoT ecosystem. Um, I will part answer that, and then Jeff can comment on what I've said. So the SIM card is absolutely crucial in the IoT ecosystem, but it can also be viewed as an IoT device when it has a series of programming steps embedded within it that add extra functionality over and above what the sim card was initially designed to do yep so next week we will talk a little bit about uh, multi imsi sim cards and uh, uh, in particular the application of these sim cards to um, global networks because iot is all about being able to send your device anywhere in the world and it will work uh, and uh the the whole way in which those multi imsies are managed is a little piece of um, uh, programming on the card itself. Hmm. And just uh, to explain that, an, an IMSI, and I can't remember what it stands for, but an IMSI is the globally unique phone number. So every every phone that you have has multiple globally unique numbers. You have your phone number for making voice calls and sending SMSs to. You have the IMEI, I -M -E -I, which is the hardware code for that de individual device, like the hardware address of it. And you have the IMSI, which is actually a network address and is the core network address that's, that relates to your subscription and is specific to that network. And a phone with multiple IMSIs can have two personalities or multiple personalities where it has a new personality according to the network that it goes on. And it when it go when it detects that it's entered one of the networks for which it has a valid IMSI, it says, I'm now this personality. And therefore that relates to things like charging, the way the data traffic is routed and all sorts of other things come out of that. And it's different to normal roaming because it means that your SIM card, when it goes to a different country, becomes a SIM card native to that carrier rather than external and roaming on it. So it has quite a lot of implications for the way things work. The second question I was going to raise 
and it's not really a question, but it's just something that um, has come up in the chat, is about things like LoRaWAN. So John has been talking about Laura. He runs a big uh, network for smart cities in Perth. And it's nice to see that Perth's actually got a smart city application. Um, yeah. And they use Laura. They use LoRaWAN. And essentially, it costs them nothing to run. So he's talking about, you know, Sims being horrendously expensive. But uh, maybe you can just spend a couple of seconds on Laura before we get on to this, Jeff. Yeah, so um, we, we've we cheated a bit here, haven't we, in that um, while, while we talked about uh, multiple um, uh, connectivities uh, in earlier uh, times we've tended to focus on cellular and in this case on satellite as well um uh i th i think it's it's um that this tends to be uh in part because uh if your if your project is 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 uh global or even um uh extensive out uh, out beyond a given uh city um like national or even statewide, um, then it can be uh, it, you. You have to fall back onto cellular networks, or if they're not available, onto satellite networks. Um, uh, but if your project is is focused in a region where there is support for for um, uh, LoRa or LoRaWAN or or similar, then uh, you by all means use it, and you'll save some money. Yeah. Um, it's it's horses for courses, as as we would say in uh, here. It, it's obviously the communications network that you're going to choose has to have the coverage required. It has to have the throughput required. It has to have simplicity or as much simplicity as you can and security, and it has to be doable. So if you are a city where you have control of many um, you know pieces of land and assets all over the place, to set up a LoRa network is a is a very very good idea. If you're a relatively medium-sized organization that's trying to connect to your people who are spread or your devices that are spread all over a country or a state or a, a wide regional area, then you have to look at other things because you can't, A, you can't locate the LoRa network and B, you can't connect it all up throughout there because you, you don't have the physical capability of doing it. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, good, good. Um, Complex communications. I think yeah. I know which one this is. Oh, yeah. Yes, indeed. Um, uh, it, it, the car's nice, but I put the car in every slide, Shane, so you can jump forward. Um, so here's my here's my uh, diagram. And uh, the key word really here is, is hybrid. Um, uh, and it might be um, uh, all sorts of... of of different um, modes of communication. In fact, these cars communicate Bluetooth as well. Um, uh, but but generally speaking, uh, generally speaking, they are cellular uh, and they are iridium. So let's let's go back a step and describe what this app is for. And I'll I'll take a stab at it, and you can correct me. Yeah. Um, from my memory of this application, this is primarily for safety but also for race timing for rally cars that go into all sorts of weird places around the country many without cellular coverage and many with some cellular coverage is that a reasonable summation so it it, it is often about race timing so they can determine who the winner is but it's also about safety in case somebody goes off the road and has an accident yes and it's particularly about safety actually because uh, what tends to happen is, um, if you if you have a if you hit a tree at speed, um, then uh, you you will tear your aorta. Um, it's a very common injury, um, and then you only have a couple of minutes um, be before you expire. So they've really got to know that that's happened. Um, but if nobody's there at the time, uh, particularly with rally cars, then they're not going to know. Uh, so, so that um, th that that is the particular OHS, the Occupational Health and Safety application uh, of uh, this device. So it's a complex device that they this company designed for themselves. Um, it do, it began life doing only iridium because most of these rallies were 
uh, in places where there was no cellular coverage. Uh, but then, uh, but also Bluetooth, uh, because uh, two cars would communicate with each other. And the idea was if one ran off the road and the other passed that point, they would get a Bluetooth message. Uh, and so uh, that also was built into this design. So it was probably three modes of communication. When this company moved, especially overseas to Europe, where there's much better cellular coverage, but also they do um, stuff now in Japan. They do um, they support rallies in Canada and in the US uh, and in uh, Saudi Arabia as well and the Middle East. Uh, so in some of those places, there's good cellular coverage. And so they use predominantly cellular and they don't use the iridium so much. And the device, um, I assume, has logic in it that says, I can see a cellular network, therefore I will least cost route all my communications. Uh, uh, absolutely, it, it it does that. Um, uh, but there's there's a special um, there's a, a a special point to that um, in that the um, the cellular is much uh, is much prompter, so within within a second. Um, but the iridium isn't bad. Um, uh, we've done more than a decade's worth of metrics of how long the message took to get from the car to the server. We have a measure of that, and we've logged that for a decade. Uh, and the answer is about 15 seconds, uh, which is uh, um, very remarkable. Um, so, ah, Cambodia. Wacko. And the, the reason for that is because of the... As, sim as much as anything else, it's just the simple over-the-air time to reach even a low Earth orbit satellite network like Iridium to go up into the air, to go back, go through all the network and then back out the other end. Yeah. Whereas um, terrestrial phone networks, it's usually about a quarter of a second to do the same thing, plus the overhead from everything else. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the especially important things implied by this diagram uh, about Iridium is that... Um, that it is uh, it is uh, bi-directional. So you can send a message to the device and you can receive a message uh, from the device. And that's been very important for this customer because they uh, test their devices constantly because they need to be working. Um, and uh, because you, you can't guarantee in every circumstance that the the uh, de the device, the vehicle, will send a message. Um, you, if you're concerned about it, you can check it. Uh, so what they always do at the beginning of every day is, every day's racing, is they send uh, a, an MT message to all of the devices in the network, uh, and they time the, um, the uh, duration of the return message. No return message means at all times of the day or night, Saturday or Sunday, they ring me up and say, what's gone wrong with this one? Uh, yeah, we didn't get a reply. Um, and normally they'll be right and there'll be some configuration issue that's my fault uh, and not theirs. But they're very uh, fastidious about making sure that the device uh, um, is uh, constantly in test. And one of the benefits of a cellular network is that they can send an SMS to these devices and say to, because they program the device themselves, they send an SMS saying, send us back an Iridium message. Um, and so it and so it will. Uh, and so they've got all of those bi-directional comms built in. Now, what I wanted to just draw your attention to, and this this, this is my my day job, so I mention it here. Uh, in that box called Core. So um, uh, Core Wireless do a whole lot of uh, Iridium uh, messaging, uh, um, picking up the messages, passing them on uh, to customers, picking them up from Iridium uh, and in re reverse order as well. But here we did something a bit magical. You see that box, um, uh, that not only is the iridium traversing that box, but the GPRS is traversing that box as well. Um, and so Shane, if if Shane goes to the next 
uh, slide, I've called this uh, X uh, traversal uh, in the network. Both types of messaging are crossing that box. And so we wrote some smarts uh, which which make sure that the 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 um, that if the messaging is on one channel, it's not on the other. Um, and we monitor which channel it's on, and we monitor the locations of uh, each type of uh, channel. So we know where where the particular device is um, uh, that's doing GPRS, and then when it switches to satellite, we know exactly where it was at that moment because we're seeing both of those lots of messaging. And we do a whole lot of that monitoring, including the, the timestamps that I talked about a bit earlier. For, just for clarity, Iridium SBD is short burst data, which is a little bit like an SMS in, in theory. I mean, it's different, but it's, it's a small message that goes out from Iridium and they charge per message in the same way that people do for SMS. Yes, yeah, yeah. Now I mentioned here, and I I really like this as an example of of how this particular Internet of Things project has developed over the time. Um, pre run and post run, I mentioned. Um, uh, post run is sort of obvious. Uh, if there's an accident, um, the police come knocking straight away, and they say, uh, "We hear that you have all sorts of interesting and important data on." Uh, what's going on with these vehicles, how fast they're going, where they are at any moment, uh, how close they are to each other and so on. Um, please deliver it. Uh, and this this customer of ours has a mechanism for doing that quickly and easily because they're asked fairly often for it. Pre-run is more interesting, I always think. Um, these satellites are, uh, have occasional black spots. Um, and they're, they're not locations so much as they're locations at a certain time. Uh, and because satellites are always where they're supposed to be, uh, you can uh, predict where the black spots will be. And what the customer, this customer regularly does is to run the event before the event to see where there will be black spots so that they're not surprised by them. Um, and this uh, Ar and Iridium network is able to do that. Uh, and they're able to make sure that they have cellular coverage uh, if and when they're going, they know in advance that they're going to lose their Iridium network. That's... Uh, and, and most of that is actually run inside core systems. Right. Shane. So uh, the black spots are usually caused by things like fault, known faulty satellites and the like that produce, because it's not, they're not stationary satellites. They're always whizzing around in a in a sequence. And as you know, as with all sequences, some of them get out of sequence from time to time, or they develop faults in particular areas. And that's why you can predict the black spots as they go yep. around and around. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. So lots of interesting comp complexities in the uh, in the data logs for that project. Um, uh, Answer to Ming is uh, short burst data. I think it might be in a quiz, Shane. I think we actually just mentioned it about three minutes ago. We did. Um, I'd also encourage people to put any questions into the Q&A because we're not far away from closing it off. It's 8.15 and we'll be closing down in less than 14 minutes completely. So um, ah, very we've good. got a couple of slides to go. A couple of slides to go. Let's do one. So I, I put some summaries in. Um, I actually, I actually think that this is only a fraction of the questions that we've tried to ask, and certainly the ones that are banging around in my head. Um, uh, it, does our IoT include humans? Uh, I, I think I want to say that it does. Um, uh, it certainly includes humans in the sense that good IoT projects have a whole lot of programming built into them. Everywhere where there's a, a logic context, there'll be a program running and they will interoperate and uh, humans will have designed it. So in a fundamental way, right at the beginning in the design, there are humans. Um, uh, it's very important to, to um, exploit 
um, hi hybridization, I say. Um, that is to say, think about not a single but multiple modes of communication, both for redundancy uh, and for um, saving some money. Um, there's a typo here, Shane. Could any of these examples that uh, we've um, given, the three at least, and a couple of others we've mentioned, could we make money out of any of them, do you think, Shane? Well, we know the rally car one does. It's been going for more than 12, 15 years. And, yeah. and But that that was because, if we go back to the principles of the project in the first place, the people who run that are rally car people. They saw a problem and it was about safety and timing and all the rest and they had to find a way to solve it. And it didn't matter to a certain extent what it cost because the value of a human life was much more than the cost of doing it. And in order to run those rallies safely, they had to have something that could alert them to these sorts of accidents so that people did not die or less people died, let's put it that way. And so therefore... They, that had a business case, it had a driving imperative behind it, and it was then just finding a way to make that happen. So a number of the other ones, hard to say whether they would, well, is it that they make money or serve a purpose? So something like the one for the trains is solving a purpose because it is actually, you know, it, they've they've moved on to a smartphone app where people can, can contact people. So that one's a tick, I would think. I think the basic tracking device option is still in that category of here's a great little product does it does it actually you know really solve a problem that people want it to solve or is it just well, i've built a better bread slicer yeah yes yeah and is it better because yeah. there are there are, if there's one thing that there are more of on the market than pet trackers it's vehicle tracking systems yes yes Yes, and ways of seeing where your car is. Yeah, and so let's answer Glenn's question, for example, here. You know, surely tracking things like trains, buses, and trucks would be financially viable. Absolutely, it's financially viable. The question is not whether tracking them is financially viable. It's how you track them. It's how you put the system in. What's the output from the system you want? Do you want, to, for example, with a bus, do you want the bus to be telling you when various parts of the system overheat because somebody's grinding the gears if they're manual gears, although these days they're mostly automatic? Do you want to see if if the driver's um, you know adhering to rules about the speed? Do you want to actually use it for the timetable uh, recognition so that it will actually um, log exactly when the bus gets to every stop and then present that information to an application so that people can say, I can see the bus is two minutes away, I better rush because it's actually on time today, not five minutes late. There are all really good applications that people do and make money out of and are very sensible. The problem with the Telstra one at the moment is that it has no specialization necessarily visible that says, okay, this is specifically useful for this application, therefore I can do that. Because nobody involved in a problem has come up with a solution. What they've come up with is a potential solution to a whole pile of problems without focusing it. Maybe that's yeah. A, yeah. a way to put it. Sorry, Jeff, let's move uh, on. Uh, uh, let's uh, keep going. Uh, yeah, so uh, my last comment about that slide, Shane, is and picks up on what on what you said. The um the guys who did the rally cars, uh, they are engineers to a, to within an inch of their life. And so they they were very pleased to be involved in a project that would would meet those immediate and important needs um, and be uh, a, a monument to their engineering skills. Yeah. Uh, and so it it ticked all the boxes for them. And and they love rallying too. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Because they devoted their lives to, to going around and following the rally cars everywhere all the time. Yeah. Yes. What we've... While we've been talking, there's been a few conversations about latency and the rest on Iridium. Um, oh, given yes. that your your 15 seconds, which I, I've got to say I remember was 11 or something back in the day. Yeah. So maybe we've lost four seconds along the way. But uh, where are the – let's break down that 15 seconds. Where does that come from? How much of it is Earth to satellite and back, for example? Um, so uh... – uh, Earth to satellite is probably uh, 
something like uh, three, but but what happens is that the the message is in the satellite while it hurtles around, uh, and then it comes back to the ground station um, at some later point. So um, often by a different satellite, in fact. Uh, yes, and so sometimes that's sent to another satellite. Sometimes it's sent back to um, back to the ground station after it's gone half a hemisphere. Um, right. So that's where the that's where the latency comes from. The the actual messaging is pretty quick, um, but um, and and sometimes uh, it'll just it'll just expire. The message will reach the satellite. It will expire before it managed to come to the ground station, uh, think, and you'll get a, a note to that effect. I think it's worthwhile teasing out a little bit because that's the difference between something like short burst data and and uh, packet data applications because packet data applications to some extent are a little bit more live because of the way they're transported whereas short burst data is a little bit like sms in that it's more a store and forward technology so it has delays inherent in the system as does sms yep yes yeah and no guarantee uh of delivery like like sms same thing um we engineered a lot around that lack of guarantee of delivery um shane we can we can skip to the last i think i i put an extra slide in with a few comments about what we're going to do next week yep. uh, we're going to talk about complex sim cards uh we're going to talk a little bit about programming and ai we want to talk quite a bit about low earth orbit uh iot as it's called um i like um the question about AI and ML, machine learning and artificial intelligence and how they relate in, in what way in the IoT systems. Um, something about power management. And I want to use the example that Shane and I built uh, of ATM machines, um, uh, which had a modem in them. Um, we'll talk about that one next week. Thank you, Shane. Thank you. And we're actually finishing just a couple of minutes early. I, it looks to me like we've actually got a bucket load on the agenda for next week. So I hope that we won't go too far over time. Um, but there is a lot to talk about. And again, I would remind everybody, there's two things. I have to do the customary and to date not done advertisement. So if you like these sorts of short courses, these are pitched at a very similar, if not the same level as our postgraduate online degrees. Um, IoT is a little bit different because it's an area where we don't provide specifically a course at the moment. There is one subject that Charles Sturt University provide and is available as, as part of several of our subjects, uh, several of our courses, that's ITC 560 and Internet of Things. There will be a survey that's around, you, you'll get sent as part of this process. And one of the questions in the survey is if you're interested in doing other courses with us and if you're interested in doing, for example, IoT in the future, we're potentially considering whether an Internet of Things short course, uh, short uh, graduate certificate course might be something that we put on the agenda in the next year or two. It takes about two years to get a course built and deployed. So if you are interested, please, by all means, let us know. And one of the reasons for doing this short course is as much to see if people are interested in it. It's an area that will uh, will uh, have some legs as we continue to go on. It obviously combines with a lot of the other stuff we do, which is about cloud um, and hosting and networks and uh, cybersecurity and all of those things. And project management, in fact, are all disciplines that are inherent and critical parts of the Internet of Things when you're building applications and trying to deploy them. But we really thank you for coming along this evening. We look forward to seeing you again, same bat time, same bat channel, next Wednesday night at 7 p.m. in uh, Sydney time, which is Australian Eastern Daylight Time. And thanks very much, Jeff, for a really interesting session. And I look forward to seeing you all next week. Oh, by the way, as of course, I nearly forgot Lil. Thank you so much, Lil, for keeping uh, everybody interested and uh, sending out the uh, updates. Thank you, Shane. Thanks, everyone. No worries.